Hi everyone, welcome back. This is our third and final video where we're gonna conclude the proof of theorem A. So I save here this slide where this is a statement of theorem A. And uh, I wanna point out that at the end of theorem, at the end of the second video, we basically prove theorem A, uh, but with all part B. And uh, the way that, uh, that went about was we had our manifold, we decompose it into these geometrically prime regions, which are regions with boundary where one boundary is a index one minimal surface, the other one the stable ones. And then you can flow the unstable one towards the stables. Uh, and that would give you a, a foliation of that region um, with controlled area. Now, uh, whoever was paying attention uh, may have noticed that when I flow us uh, by mean cover to flow, the genus right stays the same, sure, but then when there is a, a surgery, it can only go down uh, because you know the, basically the the whole surgery procedure is is replacing necks uh, with caps, so the genus is monotone. So in particular, for, for that proof, we get theorem A um, with the area control and the genus control. Why we get the genus control again? Because remember when we decompose the manifold, we, we had that the genus of each of the surfaces involved in the construction was at most two. So those unstable surfaces that we are flowing in towards the stable spheres, they have index, they have genus two, and that genus can only um, go down. Now, for this third and final video, I want to explain how we can get the diameter uh, bound as well, and that the genus um, bound goes from two to six in that process. So how? So how can it go up essentially? That's um, uh, a question that I wanna leave hanging in there for maybe towards the uh, uh, last slide, okay? So again, we, we took our manifold. So I'm gonna go back to the part where we decompose it. Um, right to the geometrically prime regions. So, and essentially, this is where we are. We have uh, the, the geometrically prime regions and we have uh, each one of them has one blue surface, which is the unstable one that we're gonna, that we can flow inside by mean curvature. Okay. Now notice that some of these geometrically prime regions, they may not have a stable sphere like the ones here on the tip, but that's okay because here we're gonna flow by, you know, and basically what's going to happen is that instead of converging to a stable surface, the flow is just converged down to a point. That's fine. Okay. So the key um, to get diameter bounds as well will be to use equidistant surfaces. So what we're going to do is we're going to decompose the manifold like this, and then now we're going to just pick one of these uh, geometrically primary. So let's say we pick this one here. Okay. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take this region, right, which is like this, and we're going to start looking at the equidistant surfaces from uh, the, the unstable boundary component. So let's go to this slide. Okay. So here. So let sigma s be uh, this equidistant surface. So all the points on the geometrically prime region, they are distance S from this boundary component S1. So what we're gonna show is that the connected component of, of those equidistant surfaces, because of course they can, they can disconnect, right? We just know that all those points are distance s, but uh, they can separate, especially if I have the manifold like opening up in two legs like that. Um, all those guys, they have bounded diameter, okay? Now, 
note interestedly that if we use mean curvature flow, we get area bounds. If we use equidistant surfaces, this is saying basically that we would get a foliation of the geometrically prime region with control diameter. So somehow to get both at the same time, the idea will be to mix up the two, okay? So let's discuss the proof of this lemma, okay? So the proof of the lemma basically is to show that, um, um, you know, we're gonna consider uh, an equidistant surface. So I drew here in red, okay? So again, you could have two connect components. So let's say we pick this one here in the bottom and we wanna show that this guy has bounded diameter. So let's pick two points here, X and Y. Uh, and we want to try to bound the distance between X and Y. And it's maybe a good point to recall that the, this, this diameter here is the extrinsic diameter. Okay, so, so the, the, this distance function here, D, which we're going to be using throughout, is the, the extrinsic distance. So it's the distance on the manifold M, okay? Right, so let's take those two points and now let's consider the points P, X and P, Y, which are the closest points from X and Y to S1. So we're assuming that this guy here is the same distance. Now note that this lemma is actually trivial if somehow S is very small. In other words, for the, uh, for the first few equidistant surfaces, uh, when S is not too large, this theorem is not very hard because, for example, say S is at most 8 pi over root lambda. So this will tell us that this is at most 8 pi over root lambda, this, this guy, but also this one here, 8 pi over root lambda. But recall that we have a bound for the diameter of S1, which is 4 pi over root lambda. So the distance between X and Y is at most 4 pi over root lambda. Okay, and this bound is actually uh, whenever we, we, we do the argument with the uh, minimal surface and so on. It's an intrinsic bound. So we can actually, we actually have the luxury of taking this curve here to be in S1 if you want. So, okay, so we have eight pi root lambda, four pi root lambda, eight pi root lambda. So this will give us 20 pi root lambda already by the time inequality, okay? So we can assume that this point X and Y are, you know, uh, further away than that. Okay, so what we're going to do is, again, we want to use um, minimal surfaces. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, I'm going to basically look at this curve joining this point. So uh, x from x to p of x to then p of y to then y and then x. So this gives me a curve, okay? And let's say that this curve here is zero in uh, is trivial in homology. So in other words, it bounds uh, it bounds a, a surface on this geometrically prime region. So we have to work that out uh, to guarantee that uh, uh, that you can always do this. But uh, uh, let's assume that that step is fine. So we just have here then that this curve bounds a surface. Now, what we're going to do is then we're going to look at the um, um, the least area representative of that. So in other words, we're going to look at all surfaces that bound this one, and we're going to look at the one that has the smallest area. So that would give us a stable minimal surface, So which is what I drew here in, um, in green. Okay, so this is going to be a stable surface with boundary. And in particular, what that tells us is that for each point on the surface, right in the interior, the distance to the boundary is at most uh, 2 pi over root lambda. Okay, so then this is what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is I'm going to then, uh, I have here, we have here X and Y are on sigma S. So let me go back two pi over root lambda plus epsilon, where epsilon is a small number. And so this will give me a distance surface that would intersect the green minimal surface over this curve. 
okay? So every point here is at distance two pi over root lambda plus epsilon from, uh, from this guy, uh, x, y, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna look at a point here, uh, uh, x epsilon along this curve and all these points here by the, the smallness of, of the stable minimal surface of boundary, these points on this curve, the, their distance to the boundary of the surface, which is the curve, is at most two pi over root epsilon. So let me take a point here, x epsilon, whose distance to, the, to this curve is uh, less or equal than two pi over root epsilon. Okay, and let's say that those those points are x one and y one. Okay, so again, I'm using the that estimate, uh, the crucial estimate we used it before. We use it now that uh, this curve, right? Um, uh, when I fill it with a minimal surface, that minimal surface, because this ambient has positive scalar curvature. I know something about the distance from the interior to the boundary of the minimal surface, okay? So this is one of the reasons why this kind of estimates are called filling radius estimates. Uh, okay, so we get this. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we argue that the distance, so this point here, right? They are, they're gonna be some point along, along this curve that uh, are at distance at most, two pi over root lambda from x epsilon. Then there is an argument uh, to show that those points x1 and y1, they cannot be too far away from x and y. So in other words, the distance from x1 and y1 uh, is at most eight pi over root lambda plus epsilon. So basically this distance here, okay? And this is comes from, using the triangle inequality, using that these are geodesics and uh, from here to here, from here to here, also the geodesic here from P to X, and then also from here, X epsilon to X, just uh, chase the triangles inequalities, we get this. And now we actually are in a, in a decent shape because this implies that the distance between X and Y is less or equal than the distance from X to X1, but then x1 to x epsilon, then x epsilon to y1, then y1 to y epsilon. So in the end, we get uh, 20 pi over root lambda uh, plus two epsilon. And then it's just a matter of uh, now sending epsilon to zero. We get that these equidistant surfaces all have um, all the diameter, the, co the connect components. Okay, now, I, uh, so that's great. I mean, if, again, if we knew how to control the area of the equidistant surfaces, that would be awesome. We, we, we would get that these guys would have bounded area, bounded diameter. Then we could talk about the genus, um, see what it could be controlled. But again, these surfaces, uh, it's very hard to control anything beyond diameter for those. So the idea would be to merge the two, okay? So, so how do we merge that? So basically what we do is, again, we're gonna use a similar circle of ideas, filling radius estimates, uh, uh, triangle inequalities and so on to show that if I have a connected surface that is trapped in between two equidistant surfaces, sigma s and sigma s plus rho, where rho is 10 pi over root lambda. So in other words, I have diameter bound for this equidistant surface. I have a diameter bound for this equidistant surface. So if I have a connected surface in between that, I'm gonna argue that I can bound the diameter of that connected surface by 40 pi over root lambda. So, okay, so that gives us a little bit of room because then what we do is to prove the theorem A, we are going to start flowing by mean curvature flow. Okay. So suppose we have here our, our uh, S1, 
which is our uh, surface that uh, unstable in our ge geometrically prime region. And we're gonna start flowing this by mean curvature flow. So we're gonna go back to mean curvature flow. So ST, okay? So remember ST is mean curvature flow. Sigma S is the equidistance, equidistance surface. So we're flowing by mean curvature. That's great because we have genus bound and we have area bound. All right. Now, it can happen that this surface starts to get uh, uh, long and we, not, we lose the area, we, we lose the diameter bound. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna look for the first time when of the big, such that my mean curvature flow is starting from S1, starts here and starts flowing. So this flow, it's hits uh, uh, um, this equidistant surfaces, right? Sigma S and Sigma S plus rho, this connected component for this row here, 10 pi over root lambda. So let's look at, um, uh, in other words, let's look at the points such that the closest points to this uh, S1 component, let's say this guy, and the furthest point apart, they are distance 10 row over root lambda. Okay, so that means that for, for this particular time S, I can still apply this lemma and get a bound. But, but maybe one second later, this, uh, this mean coverage flow is not going to be trapped in between equidistant surfaces satisfying this property for that particular row. So that means I would have no control on the diameter anymore. Okay. So let's take the first time for which the flow um, um, hits that. Okay. So what we'll do is, so let's say, um, we say we flow the big component, right? By mean curvature flow. And every time it, it hits this equidistant surface for some S and then this row, we are gonna cut along sigma L. So in other words, I have equidistant surface S and S plus rho. So let me just go to S plus rho over two. So here, I apologize, there is a type but this should be rho over two plus S. So right in the middle, I go to the middle. So I look at the, the, the equidistant surface that trap my, my mean coverture flow surface, right? And uh, whenever it hits that row, I go to cut to the middle. So here's sigma uh, L in blue. So now this is an equidistant surface. It's gonna cut uh, our surface sigma S of T into several curves. Here, I just drew uh, one, um, one situation where it just cuts into this uh, blue curve here. Okay, so we have our red surface, which is the mean curvature flow. We intersected with the uh, equidistant surface sigma L, which is right in the middle midpoint. Uh, and th that gives us this curve. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I want to, uh, see this is a flow, so it's a smooth flow. So it's basically, if I'm trying to think in the graph construction, this is basically one edge. So what I wanna do is I wanna split the edge two here. So I wanna disconnect that surface there so that um, um, I can still apply this lemma for, for, for a period of time. So that's why I've cut right here. So I'm gonna have this piece and this piece. And what I want is I want to glue in uh, something along this curve. I want to fill that that um, blue curve with something. For instance, a minimal surface would be great because what if I glue in here, right? I what I could do is I you know, and it's minimal. Then I would control the area and the diameter of both pieces. Okay. So our first um, 
reaction is to say, oh, let's glue in the disk. Let's just take the disk and gluing this is a curve. We solve the plateau problem, you know, put a disk here. Uh, I mean, if that curve is trivial uh, in pi one, maybe it is, maybe it's not. So, but you know, what do we do there? And this is the key issue for the genus bound because you see, uh, I have this curve, which is the intersection of the distance surface, sigma L and my mean curvature flow. And um, well, we have no idea what is the least area minimal surface that that, that curve spans, right? Uh, and in particular, it may not be a disk, okay? So what we're gonna use here for, for producing that surface is uh, this technique, which is minimizing the isotopy class. So basically, I have this curve, it divide, let's say this is the case when there is only one curve, but you, you can have other, you know, it can be several curves. As two surfaces intersected, we really don't know. It can, you know, they can intersect in several curves, right? But let's just say that in this one case, there is one curve. Well, so that one curve is going to divide S of T into two connected components. This one here and uh, the one at the top and the one at the bottom. In this case, by some chance, the one at the top has genus two, and it, 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 and it also has the smallest area of the two. So it has less of the area, but it has all the genus. Whereas the other one uh, has no genus, right? But it has more area. Again, it's just the case. It could be, it could be flipped. It could be some different configuration. So, so in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the one, I'm gonna take the component with less area. So this would be this one. And I'm gonna minimize in the area in the isotopy class of this component. And that's where this green, uh, this green piece comes here. So basically this would be a minimal surface with uh, with boundary along this curve in genus two, um, okay? Because maybe the well, maybe when I minimize isotopy, maybe the genus pops, but maybe or maybe it it stays two. We don't know. So now I'm gonna take this green surface and I'm gonna glue in. So notice because this guy has area less or equal than the area of, of, of red, which was smaller than half the area of the total thing. So when I, when I, uh, when I con collect, right, uh, all of this, so when I look at, um, let me get a color here that is somehow not too polluted. So, so when I look at this surface here, right, this is this half, I have this surface. So this has area less than S of T, okay? Because again, what is the area of the surface? Is the area of this component plus the area of the green surface that I glue in, but the area of the green surface is less than the area of this red one. Okay, so this guy has less area. And similarly for this one here on the top, the area is also less or equal than the area of sigma t. Why is that? Because you see what happened, what happened when I do this? Well, I have my red component here and I minimize the isotopy. So maybe the area, when I minimize the isotopy, it didn't go down too much. So that the area of this blue surface here now is twice the area of this connected component. It can be approximately twice, right? Um, so, but, but because this component here, I picked the component that has small area, right? two times the area of that component is still less than the area of the total thing, of the total surface, okay? And the area of this total surface 
is less or equal than the area that I that I started with because it was monotone over mean coverage of flow. So so that that's it. I get that green and blue they both have bounded area, uh, in in a you know by a constant that we control. Okay. So this is basically what is happening with the area. So we had mean coverage of flow, and then we did this. It splits. Okay. Now, that's that's great. Uh, we get area for those guys. What about the diameter? Well, the diameter works fine because now these are these are going to be surfaces that um, that are trapped between. Uh, this should be L is rho per shu plus s. So, so this surface here is actually trapped in a situation like this, right? So again, we, when we do that, right? We, we, we pick X of T, right? This is the exact second where this lemma is about, this, the condition for this lemma is about to be violated. And then we cut in the middle. So this surface is trapped between uh, connected components of equidistant surfaces like that. And also the green one is. So they're gonna have bounded diameter, okay? And uh, okay, so, but then there is a question, how do we keep doing this? Uh, I mean, is this gonna go on forever, right? So how do we do, basically, how do we finish the proof? And how do we get the genus uh, bound since the genus double in this case? Okay, so um, so first let me say how, how we get the genus to be uh, controlled if we were to do this process over and over. So because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the blue surface. Well, we have to desingularize here, right? Uh, at these edges and and then flow this by mean virtual flow. And this is gonna be mean convex and this is gonna be, be convex. Davi, how is this possible? Well, that's because precisely this thing that I'm doing in is stable. So, it, you know, whenever I have a stable minimal surface, I get mean convexity to both sides. Um, so this this can be desingularized and then flow by mean curvature here and flow by mean curvature there. And then, uh, Davi, what happens? Now I have something of genus four flowing in. So what if I have to do this again? And then in that process, the genus goes to eight, you know, doubles again, and you know, and then we have to do this a certain number of times. And then uh, how do we get that the genus of the foliation is going to be bounded? Well, the point is that one can, by analyzing these choices that we make when we look at connect components, and then we try to minimize the isotopy class. One can argue that uh, these surfaces that I double and I increase the genus, eventually, uh, well, at most, I mean, two, two times in a row or three times in a row, they are gonna be, they're gonna bound a, a, a region on, on the geometrically prime region that doesn't include the boundary, you see? Really what this is happening, what, what is happening here is that, I mean, this picture can be a little bit misleading. So, because a geometrically prime region is like a handle body, right? So imagine you have a solid two torus and these are just balls that you removed inside that solid two torus. So what is happening is that that solid two torus is going inside, right? And it's converging to these small balls here. Okay, so just, just picture that in this case, a solid two torus with three balls removed. Well, what's gonna happen is that we can argue that it comes a point when this region that we double the genus, it's gonna bound a solid region that does not contain any of these balls, okay? So what does that mean in that case? Well, it means that it's just going to start shrinking by mean coverage to flow, and it's going to remain trapped, right? Uh, you see, it's not it's not go it's not getting further and further away from S one anymore. It gets trapped in a region, and then 
you can okay you just converge to a point okay and then you just it, that's just going to be an edge of the graph that you know goes on and stops and then the other part is the part that is going to you know be converging converging down to those balls okay so that's somehow the argument uh, the idea of the argument to um, to get the genus bound, you have to argue that you don't have to do this too many times until you you get into a situation where you have a surface of genus, and that genus now, well, that surface now bounds a handle body inside this geometrically prime region, so it means that it's just going to shrink down. It's not going to violate this trapping condition. Again, here, the monotonicity of the flow is key for what we're doing, because if it's trapped, right, and it starts monotonically inside that trapped region, we, we are in a good shape. Okay, now, um, okay, so the other question though is, we're gonna start doing mean curvature flow again, and, and then we're gonna cut again, and what if this process goes on forever and we never really reach these boundary components, right? So uh, we can't just keep going and going and somehow, um, you know, nothing, nothing will will, will happen. Uh, well, we don't get all the way to the to this boundary component. So in other words, I flow a little bit, then I violate this lemma, and then I cut, and then I flow some more violate the lemma again, and then I have to cut. What if this goes indefinitely? And we can actually show that this cannot be the case because somehow every procedure of this, we are getting closer to one of these boundaries. You can argue that. You see, because we cut, we, when we cut, right, uh, we are um, cutting uh, by five pi over root lambda. So somehow, for instance, this guy right here is going to be closer, right, to these boundary components, the ones that you will try to flow toward uh, by a definite amount. So there is an argument there that uh, because you are getting closer and closer, eventually you're going to run out the diameter of, of the geometrically prime region, which we don't know how much it is based on the uh, based on lambda. We don't have a bound for that diameter that depends only on, on lambda, but we do know it is finite when we start this process. Okay. Okay. So um, so yeah. So then we start flowing the new components, and uh, and that the way we we get the uh, the foliation by mean curvature flow. And well, modify it a certain number of times. Now, um, let's see. the The final thing that um, that one want to say is that okay, there is something that needs to be done that I haven't explained about the regions. Now, whenever I have a mink, uh, mink curvature flow surgery, right? The small regions. Um, that it still can happen here because you know this process happened in for you know whenever I violate the lemma I have to split right so the graph but also whenever I have a, mean, a surgery of the mean curvature flow let's say I start flowing this green region here and then a few seconds later there is a surgery that's fine uh, I also split there but there is there are some regions that are going to be discarded in that process and the whole point is that those regions they're going to be small so so when i look at my my graph uh basically what i will have is i i have i start with a foliation Let's see so i start with my foliation here like the mean curvature flow then i can have a surgery for mean curvature flow right well, but right here at this point where I have the surgery for mean curvature flow, not only I split now uh, and start flowing the components here, I have this discarded regions to take care. So maybe my graph, I have to do some sort of tiny edges like this where I somehow 
foliate those small regions. There, I really use the fact that I know how the, the geometry well. I mean, the once I choose the surgery parameters sufficiently big, right? I know that the surgery is going to be happening at a very, very small scale where I can approximate my geometry by the exponential map, basically. And then I'm in a Euclidean situation and, and then I can use uh, uh, ideas from metric geometry and, uh, you know, Euclidean geometry even to, to, to do the foliation with small. I mean, it, it, you are small, you know, it's a small region. So it's, you, you obtain smallness there, no problem. Um, so you can have this here, but also when you, when you continue uh, this, you can also have now, okay, so this is the surgery of mean curvature flow, but then here I can have now a splitting like this, and there could be several components when I when I when I do uh, a splitting with uh, uh, applying this lemma. So when I cut along the equidistant surface, it could be several curves. When I go in minimal surfaces, I get several components, and then I can keep going. Some maybe some keep going like that. Maybe others just stop. So these will be the ones where. Now I just flow down to a point maybe, okay? And that way you, you construct the map from the equidistance from the uh, geometrically prime region to a graph. And now final thing to do is basically to take this, this graph for each geometrically prime region and put it together. And then you obtain the result of the theorem A, okay? So I think that's it for uh for today folks uh, again i want to thank Hojo Lee for the invitation and i hope everybody is doing well and i that we get to get together and talk math uh uh in person at some moment soon okay thank you very much again bye